All right, ladies and gentlemen, could you please be upstanding as the chief guest makes his way into the hall? All right. Thank you very much. I request everyone to remain upstanding as we play the national anthem. Please. Anthem. African National Anthem. My request to take your seats, please. All right. Very good morning. <clears throat> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the first Berlin Climate and Security Conference 2023 here in Nairobi. A warm welcome to those of you joining us online. Um, I'm delighted to be your master of ceremony this morning. My name is James Smart. I'm a journalist. I work with the National Media Group. I will be delighted to take you through the day. Now, the aim of BCSE Nairobi is to raise awareness and advance action on the multiple threats of climate change to human security, national security, and regional security. Today's conference is a reflection of the joint effort of the Kenya Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Diaspora at Delphi and the German Federal Foreign Ministry. Now, over the course of the day, we will be able to listen to political dialogues and expert discussions, uh, keeping a close focus on the rich African community of practice on climate and security. A few notes on logistics, uh, colleagues and friends. Um, as the conference is being live streamed, uh, I'd like to encourage all of you joining us in person as well as those who are online to join the conversation via Twitter, and our hashtag is BCSC Nairobi. Say that again, our hashtag is BCSC Nairobi. So please uh, get tweeting and let the conversation going. We have a lot to get through today. Uh, as you'd be aware, some incredible speakers, an important aim, so I warmly encourage you to please 
come back uh, from the very many coffee breaks that we'll be taking and the lunch that we are graciously offered by the Kenyan government so that we get through the day. It's quite, quite a big day and a long day. Without much further ado, allow me to yield the floor to Dr. Corey Simwe, Principal Secretary for the Ministry of Foreign and Diaspora Affairs, who will kick us off and invite the first speakers of the day. Makofi Tavadali. Excellency uh, Musalia Mudamade, the Prime Cabinet Secretary of the Republic of Kenya, uh, Excellency Jennifer Morgan, uh, State Secretary for Foreign Affairs of the Federal Republic of Germany, as well as Climate Envoy, um, National Security Advisor for the Republic of Kenya, Dr. Monica Juma, um, Hannah Tete, the UNSG Special Representative for the Horn of Africa, my friend, Ambassador Groth of the Federal Republic of Germany, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Kore Singoe. I'm Principal Secretary for Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Kenya. And on behalf of my Cabinet Secretary, uh, Dr. Alfred Mutua, who is not here with us this morning, um, allow me to warmly welcome you to Nairobi. Karibuni sana. Karibuni sana sana. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, has warned in its various reports that the global temperatures are edging ever so close to the thresholds beyond which irreversible impacts on the integrity of the climate system will irretrievably be broken. And the consequences of this breach are all too present. I think we, can, we all know about the devastating flooding in Pakistan, the, the, the incredible destruction caused by Cyclone Freddy in Mozambique, whose um, cost is estimated at dollars 1.53 billion the 22 million people impacted by the most devastating drought in the Horn of Africa that has killed vast swaths of crops and caused, caused the deaths of millions of livestock. It's actually estimated at 9 million livestock. And so when Al Gore, the former US Vice President, warned far back in 2006, that climate change and global warming were an inconvenient truth. He was speaking to climate deniers, those who view whether patterns in the Anthropocene as inconsequential. Yet, many years later, residual climate denialism still persists. It persists in those who think that cl climate conversations is a matter for the North and the South doesn't have much to worry. It persists and manifests in those who think that this discourse can be dichotomized and hierarchized and those who imagine that somehow any part of our globe is immune. The Berlin Climate Conference here in Nairobi disrupts these thoughts. It calls us to focus on the agency of collective action, not just on the part of the global, global north, but on the global south as well. I want to thank very much the German government for using its leadership at the UN Security Council and the G7 to be able to position the issue of climate and security. And on behalf, therefore, of the ministry that uh, Dr. Mutua leads. Um, it is really our pleasure to be able to co-host this event together with us. And so without further ado, uh, allow me to very respectfully um, request uh, Jennifer Morgan, the State Secretary for Foreign Affairs and the Special Envoy uh, for the Federal Republic of Germany to come and make her remarks. Jennifer, as you all know, is truly distinguished in this area. 
She has led many institutions, both civil society, private sector, and now government. And to have her here is a true representation of the commitment on the part of the German government to this agenda. It is now my pleasure to welcome you. Welcome. Good morning. It's so wonderful to be here uh, in Nairobi again. Um, Your Excellency Prime Minister, uh, Prime Cabinet Secretary Mudavadi, Ambassador Juma, um, Under Secretary Tete, Principal Secretary, friends, colleagues, um, what a good thing that we are t here together uh, today uh, because we know uh, that the climate crisis is, is one of the biggest security and development threats of our time. And I think um, the conflicts around the world, well, they are becoming more complex, they are coming more extensive uh, and protracted. Uh, we know that an estimated 2 billion people live in fragile and conflict-affected areas today, and most uh, of the most fragile areas are here in Africa. Uh, and this number is expected to increase further, and we need that number to decrease. Uh, and at the same time, we see that the increasing consequences of the climate crisis tend to exacerbate the conflicts over food, water, land, uh, and resources, and then also refugee and migration movements. So people in fragile and conflict areas, well, they are extremely affected. And this is why one, this is one of the reasons why our government decided to make climate change uh, and addressing it a central pillar of our first ever national security strategy that was released just a few weeks ago. And I think in doing so, we have embraced uh, a broader, more integrated concept of security, one that also focuses on the ability to ensure the well-being of our citizens, uh, puts value on international stability, and robust and diversified economic ties, and one that really puts climate action as one of its three key pillars. I think uh, the past year and a half has really proven this decision to be prescient. Uh, the Russian war of aggression has viciously highlighted uh, the connection between fossil fuel imports, energy and climate security, and peace to a German and European public, and it has caused, obviously, multiple crises uh, around the world, and particularly here in, in Kenya and on the continent of Africa. And my tenure as climate envoy has also brought me face to face with some of the climate and security challenges that many face on the ground, uh, the realities of, of the devastated and displaced communities, and of sharpening resource conflicts, and, you know, uh, has a very, very human face, uh, one that I think in, in this tragedy sometimes brings uh, communities together and band together to try and overcome the destabilizations that they have faced. In the Sahel, I met uh, women uh, that had migrated from Mali to Niger uh, due to the extreme heat, and they'd started a small farm in a village for themselves, but also for the entire village. Uh, and they were, they were raising heat-resistant crops. Um, so I think the climate crisis, it's also challenging us to advance new approaches to peace building and security. We need to think these things uh, together and act together. And that's why in 2019, we started the Berlin uh, Climate and Security Conference as a global forum uh, to connect governments, international organizations, experts, and practitioners working on the many aspects of the climate peace and security nexus. And last year, we launched the Climate Peace Initiative which is a multilateral initiative which promotes, coordinates, and advances concrete projects on the ground to address uh, the gap between the strong political rhetoric and effective climate and security action. Now we need uh, to turn those projects into systemic uh, change. So far we have 25 uh, countries that are part of that initiative. We very much welcome the interest of other countries like Kenya, 
Uh, key, Kenya is a key partner on many climate and energy issues, including on climate-related security matters. And that's why it is just excellent, and we're particularly happy uh, to be jointly hosting this new format, the BCSC Nairobi, with the Kenyan government. Um, and uh, what a what a better not better place uh, to be together. I think this BCSC Nairobi, and I'm seeing that here in the room. Uh, really aims to spotlight the wealth of knowledge and expertise uh, on climate and security risks across Africa, convening African experts, policymakers, and implementation leaders to share, reflect, learn together, and to figure out how we can act more together ahead of the climate, African Climate Summit uh, and COP28. So standing here in Nairobi, it's clear that uh, strong African leadership, it is a bright spark in this critical uh, decade. And I have immense, immense respect for climate leaders like the Kenyan President Ruto, uh, who has the confidence to chart this new development model to bypass the fossil fuel development model that we in Europe are struggling to get out of, uh, and instead to embrace climate, pro cl the climate prosperity built on abundant human and natural resources that you have here. And I think uh, this year we had the honor of President Ruto being at the Berlin uh, Energy Transition Dialogue, and he made it clear that Africa with uh, its young and agile workforce, the abundance of natural and renewable resources, um, it has the benefit uh, to be able to leapfrog into a cost curve of technologies that didn't exist even a decade ago one that supports green economic growth, uh, quoting President Ruto. So we want to work and are working with Kenya as you make this vision a reality. And I think I just so welcome all the different levels that we're doing that together. Uh, that's why we're working together to um, on your 100% renewable energy uh, target. We um, have uh, ourselves found that this shift into, or we're working for an 80% renewable energy target uh, and, uh, by 2030. Uh, and I think what we are finding is that it is the right choice for energy security, but also for our economic prosperity, putting these issues at the center of our development, our own economic prosperity, um, and also enabling us to be resilient in our uh, energy security as well, uh, along renewables um, and energy efficiency, and to create that resilient and robust market. But we also see Kenya's desire to foster a regional and Africa-wide vision of a cleaner, more resilient, more prosperous and climate-neutral Africa, one that can also become a green industrial hub benefiting uh, from the global uh, transition, and we welcome that. And I think that is also part of climate and energy security. We talk about the security aspects often as we should about um, the, the need for resilience and the impacts that are happening here and now. But it also is about how we make ourselves more resilient as we work together uh, on our energy, on our, on our land use, and on water issues as well. So I think we need to get serious about charting the new path to a new development and economic growth uh, model, one that builds on renewables, creates those new jobs, creates those trading opportunities, prioritize resilience and adaptation across infrastructure and governance approaches, in short, one that really unlocks sustainable and resilient prosperity and stability. And I think we have the chance to breathe life in this new model this year at the African Climate Summit, which is uh, we're very much looking, uh, looking forward to. Um, also through the G20, uh, hosting uh, the Compact for Africa uh, in uh, Germany in November and through COP28, uh, the global stock take, where we really need to have that uh, signal and set of decisions that we are charting forward on that new uh, way forward. Briefly, I think uh, for the COP this year, we know we are not on track on any of the goals, whether they be the mitigation goals, the adaptation goals, or the finance goals. Uh, and so we need, um, we need that to shift. And I think um, we know that finance is not flowing in the way that it needs to, to make sustainable and resilient development a reality for people on the ground, particularly in Africa. So let's use this stock take that we have at COP28 and use the Africa Climate Summit as a launch pad into creating those successful conditions for, for a real course change at COP28. Um, and I think that, that will be key 
We also uh, want to make this COP, or I think we need to make this COP a, a signal, one that for the acceleration of the global energy transition, uh, the shift in financing away. These are actually uh, working towards a global renewable uh, target and energy efficiency target for the COP because um, we think that by having such a goal underpinned by the financing uh, mechanisms, by the, the uh, skilled labor initiatives, that is the way forward that will also enable that phase out uh, of fossil fuels and the substitution, depending on where you are in your development and how much fossil fuels plays a role. Uh, this obviously needs to come together with mobilizing additional finance, creating new jobs and training opportunities, and expanding renewables production. And I think that uh, realizing uh, the benefits of that transition, obviously also here in African countries. Um, we need to forge ahead on financing. We are hopeful that this year we will finally uh, be able to meet that hundred billion uh, goal. We will that will be confirmed uh, that that developed countries promised so long ago. But we know that uh, and make progress on doubling adaptation finance, also fundamental. Uh, but also the shifting. We need to shift the trillions into the investments uh, and the support that needs to come with it uh, to bring down the cost of capital, consider how to effectively address debt issues, limiting governments' uh, ability to invest in a more resilient and climate-neutral development pathway. And I appreciate that the Africa Climate Summit will be taking a very close look at all of these issues. And certainly, um, President uh, Ruto's presence in, in Paris at the summit just a couple of weeks ago and bringing these things all together, I think, uh, is what we need. So um, adaptation, obviously, how we look at the local, bring those benefits. Adaptation needs to be locally driven and then inform that global goal. I think both to adverse the risks of sharpening resource conflicts, keeping our citizens' lives and livelihoods as safe as possible, preventing loss and damage. This year, we have to get that framework that operationalize the loss and damage fund. Uh, mm -hmm. and actually is helpful in practices before and, and uh, informs our adaptation planning. Um, and so I think that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot to do. Um, and, uh, but that's why we're here. Uh, and I think um, it, it can be done if we work together. Uh, and that's why I'm just so pleased um, to be here to listen to understand, to learn what is happening here, what is useful for us to do together, uh, and what can Germany be doing on the security side, on the economic development side, on the resiliency side, um, to, uh, to work together for the change that people need to see on the ground in their lives every day. So thank you very much, and uh, over to, to you. Another round of applause. There's a lot to do, she has said. There's an urgency to that. There's an urgency to that. Um, he's been a member of parliament. A minister for local government. The minister for finance. The vice president. The deputy Prime Minister, and now Prime Cabinet Secretary. Let's put our hands together for the Prime Cabinet Secretary of the Republic of Kenya, Musalia Mudawad. I, I think he was about to migrate me. <laughs> okay. Um, Madam Jennifer Morgan, Secretary of State and Special Representative for International Climate Policy of the Federal Republic of Germany. Uh, cabinet secretaries present here and principal secretaries. Dr. Wachneck. Gabiehu, Executive Secretary of IGAD, the Honorable Madam Hannah Tete, Special Envoy of the UN Secretary General for the Horn of Africa, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen. 
It gives me great pleasure to welcome our co-host and guests to Kenya and to join in this inaugural Africa edition of the Berlin Climate and Security Conference. I extend sincere gratitude to the Federal Republic of Germany for partnering, partnering with Kenya to co-host the Berlin Climate and Security Conference here in Nairobi. Climate change remains the biggest challenge of our time. It compromises the integrity of the ecosystems we depend on and poses existential threat to humanity and biodiversity. Here in Africa, climate change is a threat multiplier. It has become a major determinant of peaceful coexistence among communities within and across borders. Impacts such as prolonged droughts and sporadic flooding cause severe food and nutritional deficiencies, as well as loss of livelihoods, aggravating the situation of the most vulnerable populations. Equally, competition over declining natural resources often result in intercommunal conflicts, forced migration, di displacements, and deaths. In the Horn of Africa, we find ourselves in a very perilous position as impacts of climate change converge with pre-existing fragility and conflicts. It is indeed difficult to achieve sustainable economic prosperity, social development, political stability, and the SDGs in general under these circumstances. Therefore, this forum is both significant and timely as it brings the climate change and its peace and security nexus in Africa to the global limelight. Africa is the least emitter of greenhouse gases, but the most affected by its impacts. However, we no longer see ourselves just as victims of climate change in need of support. We provide context-specific solutions based on regional realities and peculiarities. The African Union Peace and Security Council, for example, has underlined the importance of adopting a climate-sensitive planning dimension to peacekeeping and post-conflict reconstruction missions and in development efforts to prevent any relapse to armed conflicts in fragile communities. As a low emission continent with massive untapped natural resources, including renewable energy potential, the world's youngest and fastest growing workforce make Africa a very cost competitive location for deploying green manufacturing and industrial capacity and removing carbon at scale. I believe this emerging partnership on the Nairobi edition of the Berlin Climate Security Conference holds a great potential, both in augmenting such locally led initiatives to address the challenges and open new frontiers for collaboration. Despite the challenge, Kenya has made significant strides in the efforts to combat climate change. We are among the first African countries to enact a Climate Change Act of 2016, and also one of the first to enact laws at the sub-national level, that is the county governments. We have taken a whole of government approach in the spirit of leaving no one behind and in building synergies to address climate change in scale, including mainstreaming climate change in government programs and projects. To respond adequately to climate-related risks, to peace and security, Kenya has already taken steps 
to strengthen coordination across different sectors and the institutional infrastructure to better understand and channel climate finance to build resilience for peace. The government provides climate finance through the financing locally led climate action program to strengthen local resilience to the impacts of climate change, natural hazards, and other shocks and stresses. Equally, the National Drought Management Authority gives early warning systems and responses to climate-related disasters and risks in the arid and semi-arid lands. In addition, the government is promoting climate smart agriculture projects to build resilience to climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenya will co-host the inaugural Africa Climate Summit with the African Union Commission in Nairobi from 4th to 6th September 2023. The summit aims to break new grounds by redefining the narrative on climate change and agreeing to new and innovative ways of mobilizing climate finance with scale, urgency to achieve significant and sustainable progress on the war against climate change. The summit is expected to bring together high-level participation from governments, development partners, intergovernmental organizations, the private sector, academia, civil society organizations, women and youth. Special session will be convened, sessions will be convened to attract potential investments on renewable energy, green minerals, manufacturing, sustainable agriculture, land and water ocean use, sustainable infrastructure, and urbanization and natural capital. I believe this inaugural Nairobi edition of the Berlin Climate and Security Conference will provide additional momentum into the preparatory process for the African Climate Summit. In conclusion, I take this opportunity to invite you, the German corporate society and business community, to the summit and look forward to your active participation. With these few remarks, it is now my distinct honor to declare the first edition of the Nairobi Africa Berlin Climate and Security Conference officially opened. Asante sana. Thank you. Before he comes, I'll just highlight one thing. I want to pick up something from Jennifer. Uh, the issue of financing. Um, I would really urge that we take it seriously because fatigue can set in. Um, fatigue can set in from the various communities if the gestation period between mobilizing resources and getting the resources to the ground is protracted and it takes too long. Um, the president of Kenya, William Ruto, has been talking about recalibrating the financing uh, models within the international framework. He's absolutely right. I remember Maybe Monica will remember, perhaps Abraham as well, and a few others in this house. We had the crisis of the El Nino some years back. And we were all informed that international resources had been raised to support and help countries that had been devastated by the El Nino to reconstruct and get their infrastructure back into form. And uh, I can tell you, because I was then at the center of some of these things as a minister for 
finance, and that's quite some time back, and it would take almost five years before the countries could realize the benefit of those resources. That means the disbursement process, the conditionalities that came with it were so expansive, so complicated, so punitive, to the extent that many communities and many nations gave up on the support from those funds. So it is important that as we talk about supporting uh, nations that have to be supported from this kind of international initiative, uh, there is a need for a thorough relook at the disbursement mechanisms, the gestation period, and how those programs uh, can be meaningful so that fatigue does not set in uh, to the communities that uh, are affected. The second point that I would just want to point out is that um, in Kenya, the president has set an ambitious target, 15 billion trees um, by 2032 new trees to be planted. We are about 50 million Kenyans. If you break it down, it boils down to 300 trees per citizen. If you break it down further, that is annually, if you can plant 300 trees annually as a citizen, for the next 10 years, God keeping you alive, we should be able to meet that target. And if you break 300 trees annually down to monthly, uh, roughly it's 10 trees per month. It's doable. If it means that every Kenyan can plant roughly 10 trees, that would be good. The second thing is that it is the desire of the Kenyan lead ministry that five billion of those trees be fruit or productive trees, avocado, um, uh, uh, guavas, you name it. So that apart from just looking at the tree cover, but then there's also some serious economic gain that can come through to the citizens. Um, so that, again, uh, would be an initiative. Now, I want to draw Kenyans to something that was initiated by one of our presidents, and um, it was ridiculed in the initial stages. This is the Nyayoti Zones. Nyayoti Zones was a concept by the then president to create a belt of tea around the forests. You know, you have, you have the rhino charge who do the electric fence and so forth. But the late president said that let us have tea, a belt of tea around the forests. And it looked like a joke. And I can tell you today, one of the public enterprises that is now generating profit and is no longer dependent on the exchequer is actually the Nyayo Tea Zones Authority. Using the tea belt, they protected substantive sections of forest. And at the same time, the country is now earning some dollars from the export of the tea that is picked. And once in a while, if you're flying, you will see some long belts of tea around forests. Now, tea is a tree. Tea is a tree. So even in the 10 billion that we are looking about, tea can be one of them.
Coffee is a tree. And you can achieve that objective. So, as I speak to this, I just wanted to highlight that there's some very living examples right under our nose that can help us achieve a lot in terms of uh, saving and sustaining our climate, but at the same time, supporting communities to earn a living from their sweat. Ladies and gentlemen, Asante Sana, have a pleasant session, and we look forward to very concrete recommendations as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. A better round of applause for His Excellency Musalem Davidi. And earlier on, Her Excellency Jennifer Morgan. So I want to thank our speakers for framing and giving us those inspiring words. Um, you'd agree with me that there's a lot to think about and there's enough to go through, which sets the stage for what needs to happen next.